Inside the Birds is back. What's going on, everyone? Jeff Mosher alongside Adam Kaplan, and it's our first of the year, our first game sourced tape breakdown podcast. It feels like forever since uh, the last one, which would have been, I don't know. Did we even do a source tape breakdown of the, the tank game against Washington at the end of the year last year? Did we, did we, what did, did we have somebody tell us how they fought Nate Sudfeld played in that game? I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> hey, wait a minute. The Eagles claim they didn't tank, so hey, I don't know oh, anything. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Yes. The, uh, yeah. the plan to play Nate Sudfeld <laughs> just because he's such a swell dude. <laughs> I, that get, you know, I'll, I, it's so funny. I, you and I talked to some people who are connected with what went on with that that game. I still can't get a straight answer of what the hell happened. <laughs> so ridiculous. I, I agree with you. It was like that, you talked to a different person, you got a different response. That was an that that game was emblematic of their season. What a disaster. Anyway. Anyway, well, we digress. So by the way, I, I did not make this announcement on Monday's pod. I think I we just caught up in the game and everything, but we have turned the page from season three to season four now of Inside the Birds. Uh, I feel like you and I are KG veterans now, man. We've been doing this, uh, well, for three years in the books and the start of our fourth year. And um, it's amazing to think how we've grown just in the last, really the last year and a half, two years with other shows underneath the ITB umbrella, with the pregame show, ITB TV, everything that's fun, the YouTube channel, the radio uh, show that we have on the Fanatic, 6 to 8 p.m. Monday nights during the season. So uh, congratulations, my man. We're doing good here in year four. Look, it, without you saying yes, there's no inside the birds. You, you know, I, I it's just, I mean, I take it back to the spring of 2018. And I called you, you know, our, our, my friend Bill Osborne, who later became a friend of yours, mm -hmm. he asked me if I wanted to host a radio show with him. I was like, hey, I, I got a friend of mine, Jeff Mosher, I think would might be interested. He didn't know you then. I said, uh, I think he speaks my language, just getting to know him over the years. I, I think he loved it. Mm -hmm. He might want to do something like this. And, and just on a lark, I, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, I, did I call you and said, hey, this is my friend Bill Osborne and I are doing a show. Would you be interested? You know, I want to do an insider show. First, we were at a practice or something. Um, I, I wasn't okay. with, I was obviously with the Fanatic at the time, not with CSN, okay. but I don't know. We bumped into each other somewhere, maybe at a training camp. Um, and the, the seed was planted, but then you called me. Yeah. Yeah. To borrow a line from a very famous movie, though, you had me at hello, Adam. I mean, I, I was. I, I thought, from the you know, <laughs> we never had, we, you know, I, I, I recruited you to ESPN, you know, ESPN.com. I, I was hoping they would hire you. And I know it kind of went fairly far, but, you know, unfortunately it didn't happen. But I know they were interested in you. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I always was a fan of your work. You and Ruben Frank, of course, at, at when you guys worked together, yeah, CSN. Man. Mm -hmm. And, I just was like, I, this guy, he, he digs, he, he, he gets scoops, he loves the background and stuff, just like I do and the fans do. I'm like, All right, let's, let's see. The worst you could say is no. <laughs> there you go. Right? right. And, and well, we had done the draft I, show together, by the way, at the Fanatic. I think that also helped foster that relationship where we knew what it was like to work with each other. Oh, how could I forget? In 17, yeah. So Jeff and I for the Fanatic, that was an unbelievable time because the draft was here in Philly in 17. Mm -hmm. This is a lead up. The fans wanted Ruben Foster. Who, uh, you know, Derek God, Barnett has been okay. Amazing. But I forgot about that. They really did. But, oh, it, and you know, I remember you saying, "Hey, could you f dig and find out how deep they are in Ruben Foster?" And I said, "I know they sent Dom DeSandro down, uh, their their uh, director of security, but I'd heard they're not drafted from the first round. I didn't. I just knew they would not draft from the first round. I didn't know if they took them off their board, which I think they wound up doing, if I'm not mistaken." Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, they weren't going to draft him. I had no idea they wanted Barnett. You know, I just knew that I put it on our show. They're drafting McCaffrey. That night I said, they're drafting McCaffrey if he's there. If he's there. And I'm like, I remember saying that. And, and I remember thinking, man, I got really good sourcing on this. But the problem is, when the hell, they're not drafting a running back in the first round. Is that the but same draft the, Mike Williams went fourth overall, by the way? Mike Mike Williams. Mike Williams. From, from the Chargers. Was that the oh, same 17. Yes. Yes. So, so that, he was in the 17 draft. Yeah. Because they picked him the fifth year option. Yes. Wait, 17, 18, 19, 20. Yes. Amazing. Yes. Okay. Um, but long story short, so Jeff and I did that show and we, we had really good chemistry. You're so easy to work with and you, you've got a great, very underrated sense of humor, by the way. It's very, the, <laughs> we don't get to see it. We get to see some of our nonsense on the show. But anyway, we got to know each other and that was, you're right. That was probably part of the reason why I called you. 
but I wanted someone who really wanted to get to the behind the scenes. Why do they make, why do they make this decision? Why, why did they do this? Why did they get it right? Why did they get it wrong and stuff like that? And that was the genesis of Inside the Birds. I wanted to do a true insider show. Um, and I, I knew when I worked for ESPN and we had the NFL Insider Show, which was we used to call it the little engine that could. It became sort of a like a um, sort of an, uh, not an underground show, but had its had its core audience. They loved the show, but mm-hmm. I was you know we were part of the layoffs uh, that that show because they couldn't staff it because Disney made a decision they were going to lay a lot of us off. Um, they couldn't have the show anymore, and I'm like, there's got to be an Insider Show for the Eagles. Why isn't there one? Uh, you know, I well, checked around. I was like, yeah, there isn't one. Right. And, you know, that, that's why, you know, that's when I called you and you said, okay, yeah, sure. And you didn't know Billy then we got, you know, you got to know Billy and Billy left us after the first year and we didn't know what we were doing. We were trying to figure it out as we went along. I wasn't even sure if I want to continue because we, we didn't find an audience because yeah, I, I knew doing um fantasy show with my nephew, Sam in the late nineties, early two thousands that you, you got to hang in there. You're not, don't get discouraged if, for other podcasters out there. If, I know we, we, we've had some people email us over time for, for advice. Would always tell them, don't worry about the low traffic numbers. I, I didn't know that that was going to be the case when I got into this. <laughs> you know, it was kind of humbling. But mm-hmm. if you hang in there, give people what they want. They don't necessarily have to agree with you, but give them what they want. They want to know why and mm-hmm. how. And that's been the mantra yeah, of Inside definitely. the Birds. And, and as you said, you're for... I never thought it would be like this. I when we and then we had to create a media company because the thing got too big for us. We had to hire a business <laughs> manager, the great Josh Weinfeld, who is indispensable. We have no chance to keep the show going without him. Zero. Um, and and the interns that you brought in who were great and just terrific, great kids, and the support has just been overwhelming. And I, I'm humbled by it. And it's just uh, nothing that we ever imagined. It's only going to get bigger, as you said. Yeah, definitely. And now's a good time to thank all the people who have been involved, either sponsors, interns, Andrew DeCecco, who writes for InsideTheBirds.com. Thank you, yes. You know, people who have helped us with our website from Philadelphia Media Labs to Squatch. I mean, we've just had a lot of people um, who've done really good work with us, for us, um, alongside us. So uh, we appreciate everybody who's been involved. Mark Mark Colazzo from the the Fishtown Business Business Improvement District. Is that that how you say it? Yep. Mark is just a wonderful human being and an unbelievable supporter. Brett Shoulder from um, Sky Motor Cars, mm-hmm. SkyMotorCars.com. Um, as you said, DraftKings have been in there. Uh, they, they've supported, they, obviously, they have Eagle fans there, which doesn't hurt. Um, Ethan, right? Yeah, our man Ethan. That's right. Yeah, who's awesome. Um, we have so many sponsors now. It's just, it's, it's, again, we didn't know this. We had no idea what we were getting into, and it's just uh, you tell us what you want. I mean, you, you, the fans tell us they don't they don't want a, a podcast shorter than an hour. Or so <laughs> I we, know we, it's funny. I, was, I was shocked. We did fifty seven minutes. I thought we cheated everyone. <laughs> last one. Yeah, well, you know how it is during the season when we do three a week. It, it, we may have yeah. a few that are less than an hour. I think people will be all right with that. I know some people have commented, "Why don't we do one every single day?" But I think that would be listen between our three pods and then. ITB TV and the Q and A show that we brought, we do have something every single day. And then of course, yeah. inside the birds.com, which I hope everybody is subscribing to and checking out the content. We, there's something ITB related every single day. And we're proud to be able to do that. And, and we appreciate the feedback. Right. And Jason and Q coming on. Thank you guys. And, and Trey Thomas, I know we would love to have Trey. People have asked us and Jeff, so could you, could you kind of bring us up to date what Trey's doing? He's the offensive line coach at IMG Academy. And most people who know sports know what IMG Academy is. Great football, great basketball team. It is a, it's a school really to, to, to have great athletic programs. I mean, it's also a school, but that's what they're kind of known for. Uh, and he's coaching the offensive line. And if you didn't know who IMG Academy was, you probably found out <laughs> about three weeks ago because they were kind of, they were involved in that game against the fake team known as Bishop Sycamore that IMG was pummeling by about 45 points. No, I didn't know that. Third quarter. Oh, you didn't know that? You didn't no. know this whole, you, you know about the Bishop Sycamore um, controversy, right? No, the, no, the, oh you know God. the reason why? Well, no, the reason why I know IMG is because that's where Jordan Mylotta's legend grew and Jeff yes. Stoughton worked him out there. Yeah, I mean, but but you didn't know about the Bishop Sycamore controversy? No, tell, what, what is this? Yeah, oh, I don't okay. know this you, might, you are living under a rock, my friend. So I Bishop know. Sycamore. <laughs> played IMG Academy like in this season opener it was on ESPN a couple of weeks ago and IMG was just kicking the crap out of them and the, the even the announcers for ESPN made a statement that they were told 
Bishop Sycamore had Division I athletes and was supposed to be a great football school, but they couldn't verify any of the names on the roster or <laughs> cross-check them with their people to <laughs> confirm that this was actually a really good football school with potential Division I recruits. And what people found out later, like a day or two later, is that it's like not even a real school. And the, the head coach is... <laughs> sold everybody a bill of goods on who they really are oh, and God. somehow they got on espn and there they are playing img academy in a clash oh, of titans that I... looked like you know it looked like uh you know the the the, the kansas city chiefs versus your local high school team oh my gosh <laughs> was, that reminds bad. me of the remember that when the little league kid like the one year that the kids were were way bigger oh. physically and way older than they were supposed the to be like pitcher. Thir- i think his name was danny almonte danny. or eric almonte i forget right Dan- right Bronx. good call yeah. so yeah so now yeah. you're gonna make me read all this when we're done here all right wow what a story yeah you got yeah bishop sycamore google it you'll have a, it. You'll, you'll go yep. down a nice little rabbit hole there all right so thanks to everybody and by the way as we always do we should say for all the listeners and you, you're multiplying and we really appreciate it we're very happy to have you along. That's why we try to answer as many questions. And we just really appreciate the support as we uh, start season four here. We love all of you. And and whether you disagree, come at us. It doesn't matter. We're just, we're just happy that you're listening and, and hoping exactly that you're right. enjoying yourself. Yep. So yep. Uh, let, let's go. Let's get into the, the, um, the nuts and bolts of this. We'll start with some transactions. So T.Y. McGill came off the COVID list and then was promptly uh, released. So he is no longer with the team for now. Um, this is something that's weird. I almost forgot it existed. LaRaven Clark, the offensive lineman on the practice squad, is now on the practice squad IR. So he must have hurt himself in practice. And so is there mm-hmm. is there a short term versus a long term practice squad IR? It's a great question. I've never asked it. Uh, I'm going to have to ask. Um, I hope he didn't have a setback with the Achilles. No, that would be because remember yeah. now with um, the other kid that's on IR, um, name is Casey from Auburn. Jack Driscoll. Jack Driscoll, thank you. Yeah. So with it, because they still are, they still have enough depth, but it would be way better once they get Driscoll back. And what if they would have had uh, Clark, it would have been really good. So this is a little bit of a setback for their depth because mm-hmm. uh, Clark has position versatility, left tackle and guard. That's a, that's an issue now. They, they can't, you know, knock on wood now. They don't have any more injuries, but that's a little bit disappointing. No doubt about it. So to fill his spot, on the practice squad, they signed your favorite player from training camp, <laughs> the center, Harry Kreider, to the practice squad. So um, they protected four Harry. players. Amazingly yep. enough, he was not protected. <laughs> he was not protected uh, <laughs> Marvin Wilson. It's weird. I think all four guys they protected were not the same four from the week before, right? Uh, maybe Craig James. Well, Riley was. Only... Oh, right. Elijah Riley, Craig James, Marvin Wilson, and Coyote Awasika. Did I pronounce that correctly? Awasika? I think it's Awasika. Awasika. Yeah. Awasika. Yep. All right. The guard slash center. Uh, but it's, it's strange because Jordan Howard was not protected this time. And John Hightower, who was protected last week, was not protected. So I thought that was interesting. And I don't know if you saw this, Adam. Kind of went under the radar. But the 49ers signed a running back. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it. <laughs> who happened to used to be on the Eagles. It was carry on Johnson. So I wonder if that's for Intel or if I know they're hurt. They obviously lost Raheem Mostert. But, um, you know, you would think that, I, I don't know, I guess there's just not a lot of running backs there uh, out in free agency. So they went out and got carry on Johnson, which I find very interesting. Of course, th- there's no question. I, I used to get a laugh when teams would say, oh, we just, the guy happened to be available. We picked him up. Of course you picked him up because they're playing the Eagles. I, I, I just love yes. when teams deny this. I roll my yeah, eyes. You got like, a job on, for man. a week, brother. <laughs> right, right. Look, you know, I know we're going to get into uh, San Francisco more for Friday's show, but look, they've got a big issue at running back. Uh, Elijah Mitchell came out of nowhere and had a great game in week one. You'll see plenty of him against the Eagles. Trey Sermon uh, was inactive. Who He had a good training camp. They didn't think he was ready. Jermichael Hasey, I love watching him. He's physical and he's, he's tough. Uh, look, they, they needed to get some running backs on the practice squad, so – uh, carry on's going to be that guy. So look, I don't, I doubt that he would be signed off the practice squad for this game, but look, bottom line is, mm-hmm. um, carry on knows his scheme, ego scheme. The timing is interesting and we'll see what happens. Now I know, I know the fantasy football flavor of the week is, is Elijah Mitchell. Oh God. Yeah. 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 So we'll see. Um, it's weird because Trey Sermon was not active. It would be so Shanahan like to give Trey Sermon the ball like 25 times against the exactly. Eagles. Like his dad. Play at all. Absolutely, because he didn't play at all in, in week one. So right. it's something to watch for 
as we get deeper into the week. Um, I know you, you've you been talking about Keyshawn Johnson on the practice squad. He came yeah. over, he was on the Cardinals last year, and you have some interesting notes on him. Yeah, he was actually last week the offensive scout team player uh, of the week and off, also the overall scout team player of the week. Look, I know it's early. Um, the chances are not great that he'll be added to the, from their practice squad to the active roster because, quite frankly, if J.J. Ortega-Whiteside is available this week with a shoulder injury, that's five receivers. You don't really need five. Quite frankly, the other thing is Greg Ward's really not involved. He's been sort of – his role's been minimized. Uh, Rager and Smith sort of dominated the um, activity at the wide receiver position in this last game. So mm-hmm. I don't think they need to add anybody, but Keyshawn Johnson – is a guy that's pretty sharp, good route runner, not fast at all. That's why he dropped in the draft, but he was a productive college player. We'll see what happens if they ever need him. I mean, he, he obviously needs to learn more, but I'd heard what the word is that he and Flacco did very well last week. So it's, a, it's you know, look, this is they, they, somebody must have liked him because uh, mm-hmm. that's why they added him. And, you know, being that uh, they need to develop some of these younger wide receivers, you mentioned Hightower is not protected. You know, Hightower now, Keyshawn Johnson, and Travis Fulgham are the receivers on the practice squad. Yeah, I mean, I think this begs the question of if they needed, if they were in a pinch and needed to bring up a wide receiver, has Keyshawn Johnson already overtaken Fulgham and Hightower on the totem pole? It's too early. I don't know. I, yeah. He's only been here a week. But right. here's the question. Just, just responding to that, it, it comes down to this. What is your confidence level if you're a coach that whoever you bring up will be able to do what you need him to do? Because Hightower and Fulgham are just better. Well, Hightower were unfaster, right? Fulgham is the most talented of the three, but Fulgham, we, as we've detailed now for nine months, has fallen off to the point where, I mean, as you said, he hasn't even been protected. Anyone could sign him off their practice squad. They haven't, no one's even signed him off their practice squad. That, geez. That's, that's just, not a good uh, sign. It's a, so it's a, it's a it's fascinating, honestly. I just yeah. find it. I almost find it even more. Fa- oh, it's almost like a soap opera twist here that Keyshawn Johnson gets here, and they give him practice squad player of the week or scout team player of the week, whatever it is, over those mm-hmm. two guys. I mean, it's like the it's like at every corner they're just trying to tell these other two guys, "Come on, dudes, show up." You know, like you're not. <laughs> These guys got to get motivated. I, I wonder how they feel, Hightower and Fulgham, about seeing this guy who's been here for a week come in and suddenly get that kind of an award, you know? Well, right. Look, it, it's it's important to coaches because you want to give, when you're in the scout team, you want to give looks, you know, to what the other team looks like. But um, we'll see. I don't know if they need him. We'll, we'll, we'll see over time if, he, if uh, Johnson looks, continues to look good in practice. But, um, you know, they like, the, again, someone liked him in personnel to bring him in, and they didn't. We'll see if he comes off the practice squad at some point. All right, download the Deal Dash app or just go to DealDash.com. When you register, enter the promo code ITB for a special offer for some bonus free bids. You got to enter that promo code ITB to get those bonus free bids on DealDash.com or the Deal Dash app. Let's get into our uh, our, our notes here, Adam. We'll, we'll start off with the offense. Uh, obviously, a 32-point eruption for the Eagles. Not something uh, I saw coming, but uh, we mentioned it on Monday. And so it'll be interesting to give our our audience a little bit more insight from a personnel eye standpoint. Um, What we mentioned Monday was how just everything seemed so schematically perfect for them. Not perfect in the sense that there was nothing wrong, but it's like whatever they wanted to do, they seemed to be able to do it. They ran the ball well. They passed in the short to intermediate game well. They made the most of their swing passes, their screen passes. They did pretty much everything except for putting the ball in the air uh, deep, which may be something that just develops in the offense. I thought I saw that, um, you know, had they had one of the lowest like yards per air type of uh, metrics in, in, you know, along the weekend. But when you score 32 points, you don't really care about that as long as you're, just, you're moving the ball. So I talked to three people who graded the tape for on the NFL, um, mm-hmm. all doing advance on the Eagles. They all said the same thing. There were very few opportunities for Hertz to throw the ball downfield in their, in their, the Falcons' zone defense, they played almost exclusively uh, zone, mm-hmm. for, or a lot of it. Um, there just were not very – there may have been two or three throws where you could have argued, you know, if you want to really argue over it, that Hurts could have thrown the ball downfield. So uh, they played the quick game. I'm looking at my notes here, just listening to – you know, let's just take notes from the people I spoke with. Um, the quick game worked. That, I want to I want to point out why this is so sure. vital, what, you're, what yeah. you're giving right now, because you're giving advanced scouts from other teams. I mean, this is about the most – unbiased 
kind of eye, you know, information and intel you can get because there's no, it's not a pro eagle sort, not an anti eagle. You're just looking at your people who are doing research basically and discovery about what they see on tape as Greg Cosell does all the time and tells us all the time. It's just what the tape says. That's all. There's no, no agenda, no bias. It's literally what they see on the tape. Right. And that's why, um, when we started the, the shows, I, I wanted to get an unbiased opinion of this football team, this organization. Um, it's not always pretty. I would cringe at some of the advanced stuff we got last year, particularly Schwartz's defense. Because I have always I have a lot of respect for Jim Schwartz, but when these personnel people around the league, sometimes there are coaches from other teams, seeing how simplistic his defense was. I know we're talking offense now, but just give me an example of what you were talking about. Um some t- and that sometimes it's praiseworthy. It just depend on who you would speak with. And it is interesting. I did. I rarely do this. I usually speak to one or two people a week. But because it was week one, I just would ask us, hey, do you have Philly this year? Because um, some of the advanced guys, they I think they split them up, each team. Like, let's say there are four pro personnel guys you have in a, a, in a department. Each guy might get six teams or eight teams, you know, just to split up the, 30, the 31 other teams. Um I just happened to text guys and, and guys kept, a couple guys came back to me and said they had the Eagles. And then another guy checked in and said that um, he doesn't, he doesn't have that. Their team doesn't play them until I think uh, October or something like that, late mid to late October. Mm-hmm. But he said he actually just started on them. I'm like, Oh great. Okay. What would what, you think? And he said, I watched it and he gave us some notes and um, they, they seemed to agree there. Was, and I asked all of them because I, I wanted to know Hertz was super accurate. and was, it was really interesting. Mm-hmm. The, the, the quick game. But I, sometimes when you see that, Sometimes the quarterback's not seeing the field clearly, like he's not taking the downfield shots when they're there. But these three guys said, nah, it wasn't very much. I'm like, okay, thank you. No, hey, listen, there, there you have it from the horse's mouth. Uh, t- Jalen Hurts took what the defense gave. That doesn't mean he was conservative. It just meant he made the right decisions. I thought that was fantastic. I said this Monday or in the Monday podcast that to go on the road, I don't care how bad the Falcons are, to go on the road when you're officially the Eagles starting quarterback and there's no question about it, and to not turn the ball over and to be that accurate and to you, you to run when the when you needed to run, but also throw when you needed to throw it was the perfect balance to me. I have zero issues with how he played the game. I thought he was fantastic. I couldn't I don't think he could have asked for anything better. Yeah, I, I just thought that he just managed the game well. You know, last year, once his turnovers, so many of them were either he held on to the ball too long. I understand part of it. And Hertz went through the same thing. You're playing with backup linemen. That was Clearly, part of it. Mm-hmm. I think we all know that, but just manage the game. They, they, the structure of this offense, it's clearly West Coast. I don't know what Nick Sirianni calls it, mm-hmm. you, but the structure is just like we were told in February. It's get it out, run after the catch. Oh my goodness, the rack stuff. Yep. It, it's so much, and the, the the Rager one. Oh my god, the Rager touchdown was so awesome, and 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 Hertz held it so well. The defense, see their defense, and they did such a great job of game planning against um, uh, Dean Pease here. They did a great job against it. I wasn't sure coming in. Like, I did pick the Eagles. I wasn't sure if they could beat them consistently like, like they did. And um, I got to give the coaches credit. I cannot give enough credit for the, to the coaches, the people I spoke with this week so far. Mm-hmm. Just really the structure of the offense was so good. Uh, and, and Hurts got out. He was so decisive. That's what you're looking for. Right. Accuracy and decisiveness. That that was, I think, the best part of Hurts. A couple other things on that that I think that that jumped out. Um, although there were penalties for both teams, when you talk about some of the things that were um cleaner as opposed to last year, the way wide receivers ran routes, um, the way for example, you know, Calvin Ridley is now a veteran. He's three three years in the league, and he clearly interfered on that um rub route that they were trying to run. The Eagles ran a few of those and they they executed them correctly and properly. I thought their technique and fundamentals from tight ends to receivers, running backs especially, um, blended well with the concept of getting rid of the ball quickly and getting guys open in space. Because those are those are all types of plays where it's not like a back shoulder throw where you need one guy to just run up and make a play, which happens a lot around the league. This is all where everybody has to be on the same page at the same time. The alignment have to get to their marks at the same time that the receivers are catching the ball. You can't be an ineligible guy downfield. I think that happened once. But another, mm-hmm. but for most Lane, of the, yeah, Lane. yeah, Lane did. Yeah. For most part, it was a well-oiled machine outside of those false starts and some of the penalties. 
And I thought for as many formations as using and all the diversity and different guys touching the ball, that was really impressive. I, I You said it very well, man. I'm not, not much to add. It was just – I. You know, you won't let me – so for those of you who did not hear our show on the Fanatic on Monday night, you could go to their, their website. It's also on their app. It's 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 there. I saw it. Jeff would not let me recalibrate the, the, the team's record. We don't we don't I, recalibrate after one week. I'm right. Sorry. I we know. I get it. But Cardinal I, I, sin. I, I get, I'm sorry? I said Cardinal Sin. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I gave him a, a win range this year of seven to eight wins. I thought it was very fair uh, based on the roster. So what I didn't account for – and we'll see what this looks like midseason. When you have superior coaching, the, the other thing that I did want to add, and it, it wasn't just me saying this or you saying this, but I think you would agree, they completely outcoached the Falcons. It was like, this seems like the staff's been together forever, and the other one is a rookie. You know, The, the Falcons are like a rookie coaching staff. It, mm-hmm. I, I just believe on both sides of the football, their coaching staff, the Eagles coaching staff, absolutely dominated that game. Yeah, when we get into uh, defense, I want to talk about a few plays where I think the game really turned and some questionable okay. calls on Arthur Smith's side. And though sometimes you watch a tape and you realize, well, he, he called that for a reason. It's just that they're working with some 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 limitations there, uh, to say the least. But still, um, I you know, like you're a head coach with a, a reputation. You got to figure it out. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get into that when we talk about the defense running backs. Okay. What, what was the kind of feedback you got? I, I, one thing that stood out to me, uh, I didn't get to see, by the way, all 22 is not out yet for Game Pass as the, at, at the moment we're discussing this. So it's really annoying. They've switched Game Pass around a lot. Like it used to be so easy to just pick plays. Even when mm-hmm. all 22 wasn't out, you can at least pick the certain play you want to see in each quarter and they would play for it. It's not even, you can't even do that. The new Game Pass right now gets an F from me. It, it, it's bad. I, I, was on there Tuesday, I was on there Tuesday night. Because, you know, I'm talking to these personnel guys and they're telling me about all the stuff. I love to get – because sometimes I like to be on the phone mm-hmm. and they'll say, they'll say, hey, it was in the second quarter, blah, 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 blah. And, like, I'm looking for the time code of exactly when it happened. Mm-hmm. And they didn't have it even up Tuesday night. I was like, this is not good. I mean, Yeah, I, very, very bad they're, for, they're, for us. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's disappointing. But I we have so much tape stuff from our sources, so we're good. But, right. man, the, the there are a lot of things that happened in this game which were fascinating. The rotations – Mm-hmm. Uh, both sides of the football, uh, the game while playing over Boston Scott, I did not see that at all. That that was, right. uh, we had said that we had heard after the draft as we were getting intel on Gainwell and what was going on that the coaches had very big say in Gainwell. Like th- this is one particularly Sirianni that they push for. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's, it's some people speculate. I think it's very fair and probably true. His version of Naheem Hines, however, I think Hines is a little bit more explosive, but Gainwell is a Gainwell is just super, super talented. As we said, look, he he only played the one year, basically, of, of college football. Barely the other season. It's negligible what he played in the other season. So it was really only one season. But that, that tape and his explosive was so dominant. And I just think that this staff sees him as special. And, and here's the question. This is a great question we got from our um, our YouTube comments. And we, we promised we'd answer because it, it, it absolutely pertains to the future here, right? So Gamewell plays over Scott. Scott only plays on specials. They only played two running backs in this game. Well, mm-hmm. they only used two running backs in the run game or the pass game. What does this mean for Jordan Howard? Had a good camp and by, by and large was the number two back. My, my thing is unless Sanders gets hurt, where that's now that's where he'd get a lot of carries because we always said, what's your answer if Sanders gets hurt? Mm-hmm. I, I, why would you bring him off? Because you're seeing in this first game, I understand that Jordan Howard has sides. I get it. But there are no goal line car- there are no goal line backs anymore. This is when I first covered the league. Oh, you had to have that goal line back for the specialty back. Not anymore. <laughs> no, I mean Gainwell got the ball at the goal line. Not How about and that? he's the, the smallest of all three of them. So that, that right. and he also got the ball on fourth and one. How about that? <laughs> How yeah. about that? No, I think you're you're making a good point. It feels now that Jordan Howard is a what nine hundred eighty thousand dollar insurance policy for Miles Sanders. He, he's not even yeah, a backup. I mean, he he's one, only one year veteran minimum. But you yeah. know what? Um, there's no guarantees because they cut him. Uh, you know they cut him. So it's just interesting. I again, we're learning, and I don't know what I'm thinking. Is the front office is deferring to uh, the coach, particularly uh, the play caller, who's also the head coach, Sirianni, on this because maybe he doesn't need a. He doesn't think he needs. Maybe he thinks he doesn't need a power back. He's got Scott, who's stocky, who, who's an okay. He's you know he's decent in short yardage, but not good enough as we saw last year. 
Mm-hmm. Um, Jordan Howard is an okay short yardage back, but he's just a guy that can eat up a lot of carries. You need he's going to be good if this team is in a playoff drive. Let's say in November, December. It's cold weather. You would like to have them eat up carries if you get a nice lead. That that to me is really, but that's down the line if it ever happens. But right now, I think the question's great. I don't think they need them. But as you said last week, you're taking a gamble. Only have three running backs on the roster. But guess what? They're only using two. But it's only one game. It is only one game. We'll see what they do there going forward. I thought Gainwell also had a pretty good blitz pickup. Up, mm. in a, you know, a pass protect on a key play. I can't remember all of a sudden off my head. Which play it was? Was it the touchdown to Goddard? I don't. I don't really remember. But uh, for an area where that he he needed to make the most strides, that was good to see. So very encouraging signs for the running backs. I want to move to the wide receivers um, because, as you mentioned, there were a lot of uh, runner after catch type plays or a lot of screens, a lot of quick, quick hitters. But I tell you, watching the the little tape of the offense that I was able to see, there's one thing that jumped out at me, Adam. Uh, I had a chance to even ask Shane Steichen about it in the um, press conference. Devontae Smith can block, my friend. He, he, you know, I bet you every single defensive back that lines up across him is not concerned think, in the run game that he's going to block them. Well, they'll, they're going to learn quickly that he's an Alabama tough guy, and he, does, he just does everything with great technique and precision. And for him at that size to block the way he did effectively, he's not going to be a great blocker all the time, but there were times he was able to get – you know, like I mentioned on those quick hitters, you got to get the man in front of you to create space, and he did. I was really impressed with that. Yeah, you don't have to be at receiver 240 pounds to be able to block. It's about technique yep. and um, angles. And Smith has it. Look, he played in a pro offense at Alabama. He's coached by Nick Saban. He's been coached by pro coaches who are who've been in the pros and now at Alabama. So you're absolutely right. Um, the one thing though, I get the running back. Uh, Sanders was terrific. I'm told the tape oh, yeah. was he looked explosive as hell. He looked great. You know, Greg Cosell told us last year, he said, despite what's out there, all the people saying Sanders did not have a good year. He said, he, Greg said he he was ran hard as he had ever seen him. He had a good year by tape study. I know it wasn't as productive as people would have liked. We all said that. It's true. But a lot of that had to do with coaching and the lack of correct usage of Sanders. Um, he's headed for a big year, folks, if he stays healthy. Now, part of it's he needs to stay healthy. He's had problems staying healthy with the soft tissue injuries. But um, – you're right. Getting back to wide receiver, rack is going. We, rack is going to be big here. You saw the bubble screens early <laughs> to um, to Quez Watkins. Yeah, uh, that was interesting. Very early in the first quarter for the first three plays, as you said, it wasn't just Devonte Smith. They, they all blocked. They, they all made an effort to block w- with the run game. That means they're taking coaching. It matters to them. Just really impressive with with what, what went on with the the running backs and receivers in this game. Yeah, how about those wide receiver screens to to Watkins? Because th- those were the first three, and they, I think they were RPOs because Jalen had to pull the ball away. For it wasn't mm-hmm. like your normal you get snap the ball and then you throw the tunnel or the swing pass. Those, so I believe those were on RPOs. And, and what what happens there is Jalen sees that the numbers support throwing it to Watkins because there's fewer guys on defense on that side and and more of them. So he did it three times in a row, which was really I thought that was fascinating. But that kind of just shows you that the coach and the the quarterback here are are in lockstep. They're doing what the numbers say. We spent a lot of time last year questioning whether or not Doug and Carson were on the same page. If Carson was calling his own game plan, if he was ignoring certain check down responsibilities, plays like that because he was trying to be the hero too much. So um, it's, it's an interesting contrast to see how the offense was so schemed up as opposed to last year and even the year before a little bit where it started to look very like almost seemed like a lot of the plays were made on either second reaction from Carson or just like not the way they were drawn up um, as opposed to, to Sunday where everything seems so, you know, innately schemed. It, it, you know, with Hertz and, and everything that went on that game, you could tell he's a coach's son. He just, based on what we'd heard from our, our tape searches on this, it's like, okay, three step drop out, 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 get in the get in the pass target's hands, run after the catch. That's a guy who's taking coaching. That's a guy who knows his role. This is what they want them to do, and he did it. And by the way, against the Niners, depending on what's given them, I still think they're going to have a downfield offense. They are so fast now with Gainwell, with Sanders, with Devontae Smith. Because Watkins is their most explosive receiver. Uh, he played a decent amount of snaps. Unfortunately, he didn't get the ball after those, the, the, the opening uh, drive. Yeah. But – 
he could flat out fly. We know Rager, oh my goodness, could fly. But but wet Watkins in a straight line might be a little bit more explosive, as the ways you explained to me. Right. So there's so much speed here. At some point, folks, they're going to have a downfield passing game. It's only one F17. I can't mm-hmm. wait to see whenever that is. I cannot wait to see it. Yeah, I suspect with Watkins, just based on kind of talking with people, and uh, no one told me this specifically, but just based on what we know, is that they really work with him on getting him the ball quickly, that he doesn't run the entire route tree yet. So it's it's a little difficult for them to try to get him down the field on posts or skinny posts or not, you know corner out things like that that require um you know a whole lot more like it's easier to for them to kind of get the ball to him and let the let the athleticism come through but hopefully as they develop that then you will see kind of like what you saw against Pittsburgh when he had that one-on-one situation in the preseason and uh he got open down the sideline it was just a little bit of a of an underthrow there or an overthrow uh, tight ends, Ertz, Goddard. I thought they they obviously contributed a lot. I think both of them caught passes that they may not have actually caught. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the way, the, that's the, way the game true. goes. <laughs> you know, look, Goddard, I'm told, had a very good game, run and pass game. If this guy could play 17 games or even 15, he might be a pro bowler. That's how gifted he is. He's a – the coach sales taught us from day one he's so explosive. Um seem he, he he's a he's an athlete and he can we know he could he from day one he can block i mean that's never been an issue for him he's a pretty good blocking tight end right uh, he's a three down tight end and zach played by the way zach Ertz played a lot he did yeah how about coming in back in after you know a hammy mm-hmm. that you know we're seeing a different zach Ertz. that's that's good to see yeah well, it, it zach looked good before he got hurt you know i know as you said he came back jack Stoll played uh 18 snaps maybe something like that i think that's what it was yeah so they played a, a decent amount of uh, 11 personnel, right? I mean, decent amount of 11 and 12. I, I, I meant to go look at the um, actual statistics of it. I don't. We'll have that for Friday. Oh, yeah. we'll, we have a pretty good source on that. So we'll get all the, um, the personal groupings. But I, I think the thing we, we got to look at here, both offensive defense, we saw what we saw in week one, right? Mm-hmm. This seems to be a staff. And we'll see if this turns out to be right. But I just get this feeling. They feel like they can morph into anything they want to morph into. If they want to do heavy 11 for a game, they've got the personnel to do it because they're young and they're, they've got speed. Right. If they want to be heavy 12, they've got, they're deep at 10. They've got three guys who could play. Yeah. Ertz it's played 40, 41 snaps, Adam. That was 58% of the offense. And Goddard yeah. played uh, 52 snaps, 73% of the offense. So they had to be in 12 personnel because I don't think that they were just substitute one for the other. I think they had to be in 12 personnel probably – at least 40, 45% of the time, if not more. Well, look, they most last year, 33.2% uh, 12 to lead the NFL. So mm-hmm. um, the fact of the matter is this is a good thing. That means their personnel, based on the way that the, the front office built this thing, it's a good thing. They've given them this staff to ability to do whatever they want to do. And because Zach, now we'll see how this hamstring goes this week in practice, but because Zach had such a great training camp, this staff has got to feel like he could help them. And Zach, obviously, on the last year of his deal, has something to prove here. And I, I, I just I give him credit for gutting it out. And it was uh, – th- these coaches got a lot out of the personnel. There's no question in this game. No doubt about it. All right, let's talk about the big guys up front, Jason Kelsey and Jordan Maialata, man. Those guys – those guys came to play. <laughs> nice to see Jordan Maialata sign that big extant- extension, have a good game, and then leave a mark on uh, a viral video, right, of him just absolutely – Cleaning the clock of a uh, was it a Nickelback that he did? Was that? it I mean, Richie? It was, was it? Wait, was it? Yes, it was the safety. You're right. Was it, was um, it Richie Grant? The kid from Central Florida, Richie yeah, Grant. That's the one. That's the one. Right. He tattooed it, the, the, like for the, to the point where I thought they might have called un- necess- unnecessary roughness. <laughs> On a completely obliterated block. this guy. <laughs> you know what's funny though? I do want to mention this because uh-huh. we talked about this last year on the show, folks. If you're new to our show. We had heard last prior to Mylotta starting, one issue that he really had is he would not use his girth or his size, right? Yeah. He, he was too finesse, believe it or not. Like, he, though he was a rugby player, he needed to understand, dude, you got to bring it, man. Bring the physicality. Just get it. And it was, was it the Baltimore game where he – was it the Baltimore game where he, he started laying guys out? Yes. Well, no, I think the Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh he had a game. big block okay. against TJ Watt that really okay. kind of uh, okay. people were like, whoa, check this out. Yeah. Right. Right. So, so here, uh, I, what, what I, from what I understand, this is probably 
his highest graded game as a, in pass pro. As one source said, no one got within two feet of Hertz in pass protection on on uh, Mylata's side. Mm-hmm. He is. We'll see how good he becomes because the thing that challenged with him is technique because football's new to him in terms of right. hand usage and the way that um, Statlin teaches it. So it's still a work in progress. His technique still is needs to be more consistent, but he is so gifted and you can't teach size and athleticism. He's a super freak as everybody calls him. It's true. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he cares so much. The other thing that I wanted to just mention is just getting to know people behind the scenes who know him and uh, people with the Eagles who have been around him. The kid cares so much. He wants to please Stoutland. Hmm. I, I, I cannot wait to see his ceiling. I have no idea. I don't know what his ceiling is because he's just made this jump, Jeff. Is is this last year's just? I mean, he's not perfect, clearly, and he's not a Pro Bowler yet. But he, who the hell knows how good he can get? You know, Adam, there was one snap where I watched him, and I think he might have um, set too quickly on it or, or, or came back too far because when he was ready to punch, he was already about I don't know. You know, he was starting to get near Jalen Hurts, and you don't want to do that and invite yeah. the pass rush. So when the the lineman made contact, though. What I thought he did really well, as you mentioned with the technique, was he got his arms into him and then he anchored. I mean, once he, you know, planted mm-hmm. the feet in the ground, that guy could not move Jordan Maialata an inch. Arms. And then he started to move him back, right? You, you chop your legs to get the friction and the control from the ground, and then you propel forward with the arms. And, you know, that little bit of pressure that he sort of allowed just because he set that far didn't really matter because he was able to hold the guy off. And I thought, man, that's a really good – snapshot of just this kid's ability to understand how to anchor and use his body so if he keeps doing that um man he, you're right this guy is the the sky's the limit for him what about the rest of the offensive line i, I thought occasionally every once in a while on the right side of the line you know we saw lane um give up a pressure i think it was to grady uh jarrett and then he um was ineligible at one uh, uh receiver he, i don't know maybe it was just first game back from missing a lot of time last year but he was fine. I heard he he, 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 did give, he, he gave um, – one one guy told me that he gave up – Johnson's – the yes, I, I screwed up in the, in the last show. They did give up one sack, just one, not two. They have one. Uh, Lane Johnson was the one, and he overset, I was told. Okay. Uh, he was solid. Kelsey was it, – it's almost hard to believe. He was. He looked so dominant and athletic. It wasn't just those flash plays that you saw on Twitter. It was from pillar to post. He was terrific. Mm-hmm. I, I get in conflicting uh, opinions on Brandon Brooks. One guy told me he looked pretty good. One guy said that he had some plays he normally wouldn't have an issue with that he did. And he said, hey, maybe it's because he's come back from, uh, you know, not, not playing last season. Who, who knows? Right. But overall, th- this is a great game for the offensive line. It's a good thing to see. And it is a reason why this offense might be a little bit better than I anticipated because when you are dominant on the offensive line as they were in this game, and I know – the um, the Niners are much better defense, particularly their front. I, I get that, definitely true. But and we'll see. They're not going to be perfect every game, but they were damn good after the first couple series. It they went from like if you grade them on a ten point scale, five and a half to six, to a nine and a half to ten. The rest of the game, they just kicked the Falcons' ass. It was it was something to see, man. It they, they got a passion. You know, they're all very close, as you know. Um, I didn't. I didn't get anything on Say Milo. I don't know if you did. I didn't get anything on him. Uh, no, none of them. You guys have mentioned. I talked about mentioned yeah. him, but um, they were just great. They really were this game. All right. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use the promo code ITB to receive two hundred dollars in free bets when you place a one dollar bet on any football game. That's right. Two hundred dollars in free bets when you place a dollar bet on any football game when you use the promo code ITB after downloading the DraftKings Sportsbook app. And of course. If you want to win on sportsbook, uh, on the sportsbook app, you got to go to BetQL. Download BetQL. Check out their model that covers everything from spreads, over unders, player prop bets. I mean, they've got formulas and data that will help you make the most educated bet on your sportsbook. And of course, you can go to betql.com backslash itb or use the promo code itb to get twenty five percent off a subscription there. Let us get into defense for a little bit here. Uh, we will start it, just in general. Uh, you know, it was such a kind of a Jekyll and Hyde thing. They allowed a you know a bunch of chunk run yards in the first uh, two or three series. Then things settled down. You know, I made the point that I felt like them having the lead was their best defense because it took the run away from Atlanta, but um, did a lot of stuff. Well, on they the tried back it end. though. Actually, yeah. they, they 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 foolishly tried to keep running in the third quarter. I have no idea why. 
I just don't understand what Arthur Smith. I, I thought Arthur Smith struggled in that game, quite frankly. Let's call it like it yeah, is. Yeah, there were some. There were some strange. Way too much running calls. Right. Much running. What was the What was the general overview though that you got from some of the personnel sources? Oh, okay. So this is the overview. This is what I've come up with um, the, based on really what what I saw in training camp, and then what these guys said took it to another level. So I'm going to sum it up. Uh, I wrote highly schemed execution style defense, completely different from uh, Jim Schwartz. Players are asked to do less, just take care of assignments. And then John Gannon, you know, in his press conference on, was it Tuesday? Mm-hmm. I love when he said, and I, I don't, obviously he wasn't going to give up. He wasn't going to say who he was talking about, but he was talking about how, like, he gave an example. He'd say, he, when he was coaching, he was like, I'm, I was telling this one guy, don't worry about the quarterback. Your job is not to look, even look at the quarterback. Just do take care of your assignment, which some of it is, you know, the DBs a lot of the time are having their back to the football. They're just they're they didn't do it really much this game, the pattern matching, but this is what they they did the pattern matching in training camp. Mm-hmm. Very little of it, if at all, in this game. But this is an assignment execution, highly schemed defense. They did so much junk after the the, the, the cover two, four, six, three. Why do you think Matt Ryan held on the ball? He couldn't. He didn't know where to go. Like I give him credit for not turning it over. And did you see the frustration mm. on when the the TV uh, cameras, Fox was panning on the the players? Yeah. Their receivers were so frustrated because they couldn't get open. No, well, I mean, didn't have much time because by you know by the time Matt Ryan would drop <laughs> back, too. there would be like a couple of linemen in Matt Matt Ryan's lap. So uh, one thing that you said that stands out as far as being you know an execution style defense, which they did well, is that you know one. I always say this all the time. It's not my phrase. It's it's a common phrase in, in coaching is that a coach's job is first and foremost to put a player in position to succeed. And while that sounds obvious, it's not because different players have different strengths. So you have to be able to cater what you do to certain players' strengths within one scheme, which doesn't always work well. But when you have a team that's playing as much zone as the Eagles did, Adam, I think that's smart because you've got players who are then asked to instead of covering a person all the time and having to know if this guy matches up really well against that guy, and if it doesn't, then you have to masquerade it somehow. You just play your area, right? I mean, I mean, listen, it only works if you're getting a great rush and the quarterback's bothered or if you have really heady players who, who understand spatial awareness and zone. But for one game, they did get the front four rush, and that made it really hard when you have seven or eight guys playing – or mostly seven guys uh, – playing that zone – understanding where their area is, not trying to do too much, and just let the rush take care of bothering the quarterback. And that's that's what I thought they did really well. Like you said, the, Jonathan Gann didn't ask these guys. We, we went into the game saying, who the hell is going to cover Kyle Pitts? Well, nobody covered Kyle Pitts. A lot of people had to cover him because they played a lot of zone, and that was the right call for this defense at that time. I wonder, taking what you just said, I do wonder – we 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 know there's zone defense now because uh, what we understood one guy said speculated because he said he didn't chart it but just watching the the twenty two the uh, the tape on Monday said like I think Philly he goes they he goes if they played more than ten percent man he goes I would be surprised and he said it was totally schemed up mm-hmm. this 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 he didn't even mention Gannon's name he goes this coaching staff knew exactly what they were going to get. They, they they took the receivers out of the game after early on after the first couple series. It was like they knew what they were going to get. They knew exactly what Calvin really does. Oh, he's a great runner, runner, terrific football player. They took him out of the game. They took Pitts, as you said, out of the game. They had their way. I mean, it, it was coaches. This is also a coaches versus coaches game. And they got uh, Dave Ragone. And uh, Dave Ragone's the uh, pass game designer for the Falcons. You might remember him. A former I Louisville quarterback, a quarterback at Louisville, yeah, <laughs> right, right. Uh, that's Arthur Smith's guy. He's their he's their pass game coordinator. He's really does their their, their concepts. Th- they took him out of the game. It was such an impressive game. I know it's only one game, and Mosher won't let me recalibrate. But um, I was blown away by the, the, this. Uh, this staff's got it going on. But look, they they got a bigger opponent this week, way better. We'll mm-hmm. see how they handle it. Yes, sir. You you will probably thank me. Not that I'm, you know, rooting for for losses or anything like sure. that. But you'll, you'll sure. probably thank me for not allowing you to recalibrate and keeping it because your gut instinct is is probably correct. I mean, you've you've been around the game long enough, and if it's not, if we're wrong, we'll say we were wrong. No, no issue with that. But as I said on the radio show the other night, and I like to bring this up, last year, week one, Jacksonville beat Indianapolis. 
right? <laughs> as bad as Jacksonville was, they beat Indianapolis. And the Browns, who have just this history of being awful and terrible. Terrible week got, one, you know, too. Usually. What's that? The terrible – they got smoked at Baltimore. They, they haven't won week one in I don't know how long. I right. They, lo- they lost 38-6 to six last year in the season yeah. opener. So I'm sure all the Browns fans were, who had maybe some high hopes because of Kevin Stefan were like, oh, no, we're, we're still the same crappy Browns, and they wind up making the playoffs and winning a playoff game. So week one doesn't tell you anything other than you're either 1-0 and or 0-1 or 0-0-1. That's all. That's all it does. Uh, that's why I won't allow you to recalibrate. All Turn right. Out. I'm going to be the Debbie Downer on that. All right, let's get into um, kind of the positional groups on defense. First, I want to remind everyone to check out our friends at PHLSportsNation.com, enhancing the fans' experience with their coverage of Philadelphia sports teams. For the fan, by the fan, that's their motto. Check them out on Twitter at PHLSportsNation or at their website, PHLSportsNation.com. We'll pause real quick now for a word from our other great sponsors, including our friends at Sky Motor Cars. And if you stop into Sky Motor Cars, make sure you tell them Adam and Jeff sent you. You will get probably kicked out of the place because Adam sent you. No, I'm just kidding. You'll get a great deal, a fantastic deal. Um, Defensive line. All right, I have some thoughts on this, but before I even go on what I saw, um, I will will defer to kind of the personnel sources – to, that you've gotten. It's funny. When, when we look at the game book, we say, geez, where's Brandon Graham's name? Well, apparently he was really good in this game. Um, energy, Agreed. side to side, uh, pursuit, really good. He, he had a good game. See, this is why, you know, we, the, the tape is the, is the truth. Because I would have not known that, you know, uh, I did, I looked at the box score. I'm like, okay, all right, well, we'll see. We'll find out. He had a great game, really good. It, it's not, again, about the – it's what the tape showed. He was good. Josh Sweat, he had six assisted tackles. He won so much in this game, I was told. He just missed a sack or two. He mm-hmm. was very good. Um, yeah, be, so so j- these are guys that people had, I know I had questions about. I saw on social media, like, what happened to these guys? But, no, they actually had pretty good games. Mm-hmm. Um, heavy rotation on the D-line. It was really, really interesting. They played 10 D-linemen. That, that was – uh, now, another thing, we didn't know that they're going to open. I forgot they had a retractable dome because that was surprising to me. And that was smart in week one um, to rotate those guys. I thought Sirianni and, and Gannon did a smart thing having so many guys playing on the D-line. Yes, they did. They were. And I thought it was actually, as it was going on, I thought it was smart. This is the only thing I'm going to say about Arthur Smith. I thought it was smart of Arthur Smith to come out in a hurry up and try to limit some of that substitution that they wanted to do and try to get those guys tired with the roof open. I'm sure it was hot and humid in Atlanta because it's always hot and humid in Atlanta. in Atlanta. And it seemed to work for, for a quarter and a half. And then, you know, obviously it did not. We'll get into that. But um, as far as defensive line, what you said about Brandon Graham, I'm convinced Brandon Graham, because he's such a smart player, Adam, and he, keep, he keeps himself in very good shape. He has been doing that for several years. And now what they're doing at practice is even more so uh, enabling guys to be fresher for the season. He might be able to play until he's 35 or 36 because while he doesn't do anything great, he does so many things well. And one of them is getting off blocks in both, mm. the run, especially in the run game. So he had a bunch of big run stops, which tends to get overlooked. We always talk about sacks and pressures. He's such a good edge setter and run defender. Mm-hmm. And I saw yeah. plenty of examples of that in the game. I thought, I agree. He had a, a very good, solid, efficient game. Uh, there was another guy who I wanted to mention. Oh, yeah. So he wears these long sleeves, and with his helmet on, you can't kind of get an idea of skin shade, especially when you're looking just at, at, at video. I had no idea who he was because from the angles I was getting, I couldn't see his number. I'm like, this guy's making some splash plays. And I finally stopped the video at one point when it was turned to see the number, number 90, I believe it was, and it was Ryan Kerrigan. Oh, yeah. He, I, I remember saying to you when we did the pot after the game, did he even play? Like, and then when I watched it on repeat, right, right. And, and getting through the tape, I'm like, wow, he actually showed up. He, he had some he had some run stops and some good pressure. So for the limited for the role that he played, I thought he did a good job, especially yeah. since he missed. He's still wearing that splint, by the way. Yes, no, it wasn't. Stuff. Yeah, he de- he when when I saw him against the Jets, or in the, he didn't practice them, but when I saw him on the sidelines, um, working out, yeah, he. It was a wrap, heavily wrapped. So it's going to take him some time to get it, to figure out how he's going to tackle. 
and all that. But he blew up, I'm told, Caleb McGarry on a run play. He just he blew him up. Like yep. the Eagles, let's call it like it is, Eagles D-line abused them. They, they were just yeah. incredible. I, I got to tell you, um, and I can't wait to watch the tape. I, I'm only going to watch it because I want to see Javon Hargrave. I, these three guys I spoke to just – they couldn't stop raving, but Hargrave was the best player on defense. I guess it wasn't close based on what these guys said. Mm-hmm. He was unbelievable. It wasn't just those sacks that he got. I, were they in the fourth quarter? Does it sound right? Uh, it mostly day? third and fourth, yeah. Okay. Yeah. He was awesome. Uh, just awesome. There was a reason why. I come, now, I, 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 look, coming to the game, I said on Sunday morning on a pregame show, I, I, I feel bad about the kid. I wasn't taking shots at him. The, the, um, Jalen Mayfield, Mayfield, I said he's going to have a hard time today. That was the, and I said Hargrave's going to get him. Oh man, yeah, this kid. Man. Poor my, m- yeah, my man was dog walking Jalen Mayfield <laughs> right into Matt Ryan. Like it was, it was not pretty, man. It was, folks. <laughs> if, you, if you're one of those offensive line guru guys, like a, a Brandon Thorne, who I love uh, him on Twitter, and sure. you kind of just love watching the art of offensive line, you you weren't enjoying watching Jalen Mayfield have to. Hargrave is number ninety seven. Yes, he's number ninety seven. Yeah, he might not be a household name. I know he got paid a lot of money, but I would get this is a jersey. If I were a fan, I'm getting this. I'm getting his jersey, man. I love this kid. He's built lo- like a fire hydrant, and he's so because he gets so low and he's mm-hmm. so explosive in a short area. He just wins. And look, he was great in training camp. He's pr- you know knock on wood for Eagle fans that he continues to stay healthy. He's probably going to be their breakout player on defense, but not probably. He will be. Yeah, it looks um, like it. It looks like it. All right, can we have a discussion, though, about this backup defensive line? Because Hassan Ridgeway might be two different players. I'm telling <laughs> you, when, when, when he's asked to just, like, get off the line of scrimmage, use a good hand fight, and get to the quarterback, he's pretty good at it. You can see why he's got a job in the NFL. But, my I, man, there are times where Drew Dahlman was it the left guard, right? For in Stanford, he's, yeah. He wasn't even a starter, if I'm not mistaken. Wasn't he – he had to, like, fight for that job? I, I don't know. Either way, he's a rookie, if I'm not mistaken, yep. Drew Dahlman. Fourth yeah, rounder, yeah. yeah. There were times he was dog walking Hassan Ridgeway back six, seven yards, and that was uh, part of the issue that they were having in run defense early mm. on. I, I was a little surprised. I mean, I, I know Hassan Ridgeway got cut and re-signed, and so the, of course there's there's some flaws there, but you gotta see him improve in that area, or else you know Kyle Shanahan's gonna be waiting, just waiting for him to be on the field. Yeah, I, I and I thought because remember the the. Um, the Falcons got them on um, wide zone, mm-hmm. wide zone and cutbacks. Mm-hmm. So I, you're right, and that's all. I mean, it starts with the Niners in the run game. So I got to tell you, Milton Williams. I cannot wait to because again, this is stuff I had heard. He was really good. This Milton Williams was. Mm-hmm. I saw he, more, he, more. Oh, yeah, I would say I saw more effort and production from him than, than in the run explosive. defense yeah, than yeah. than uh, Ridgeway. Yeah. Okay, he's super explosive. Uh, we'll see if he could play with consistency, but this he's off to a good start. Mm-hmm. You can see why the Eagles wanted him. Maybe not Tom Donahoe, ha ha ha. But uh, <laughs> that, that story is so bizarre. But good man, yeah. Tom. Yeah. Uh, look, he's he, this kid had a very interesting training camp. He's 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 going to play. They got this deep rotation, man. When you're strong on the offensive defensive lines, you could hang in there against any team, folks. I'm just watch. I'm just. We'll see. We'll see what they do this week, but. Um, that's a good sign there, and uh, very smart decision by the coaches to um, to rotate. You know, they they had just to finish off D line. They mm-hmm. had a, they had alignment issues. I was told um, uh, when they they struggled on the zone cuts. They just okay. they had alignment issues. They just they, they they cleared it up. They cleared it up after a couple. All right, um, the linebackers. You you mentioned rotations, and I have never seen an Eagles team have as many different situational linebacker uh, formations as the Eagles did. So, I mean, obviously – so it looked to me, Adam, that when they were in their nickel defense, which they wanted to be in most of the time, and they they thought Atlanta could either pass or maybe run or pass, might be an 11 personnel, not sure, then you would see Eric Wilson and Alex Singleton out there early on. But – because Atlanta in the first half came out, I mean, they were there playing 1980 style football. There were two tight ends and a fullback <laughs> in there. I thought Bill Parcells might be coaching. Um, 21 personnel. Yeah. There were just, there was just a lot of, a lot of big guys up there. Then you notice that TJ Edwards and Eric Wilson would be the linebackers because obviously TJ is their most downhill linebacker. 
But the the most fascinating thing was that for all the Eric Wilson, he's our three down guy. You know, by the, as the game was kind of moving on and the Falcons were starting to run better, whenever they would come out later in the game in the, the same you know, twenty one or twenty or twenty two personnel, they would they took Wilson off and put uh, Sean Bradley in. So that sometimes you saw that? Bradley and TJ Edwards in. I think that they were just looking for a little bit more tackling. And look, you can I understand why because part of that issue in run defense wasn't just. Hassan Ridgeway, but there were some plays that Eric Wilson left on the field because he just came, he was either blocked out of it or he's he, not a very good tackler. It's, it's clear his form needs help. He was kind of diving at ankles instead of wrapping up around the legs or waist and waist. And then the running back would pick up five or six extra yards. Yeah. Edwards, I'm told, um, he was really good in this game. He even in his zone drops, he did a good job. Uh, mm-hmm. he's improved. As you, you noted a year ago, that he lost weight and he did a really good job of this game for what, again what they asked him to do. This is this is the thing with the staff; they're kind of asking guys to do things they know they can handle. Um, what we are told though with Bradley, this staff and whatever tape study they did coming in, um, or maybe it was based on college tape, they just kind of like this kid. Maybe that has something to do with it. Why he made the team? One of seven linebackers to be on the team. Still yeah. very surprised. Um, he did play 40% of the snaps, TJ Edwards. Now, it's not like Wilson didn't play. He played 85% of the snaps in this game. He played a ton. Mm-hmm. But as you said, Edwards is their run game guy. He if they're play, like this game against the Niners, it wouldn't shock me if he still played a lot. 40 is a lot for TJ Edwards. He he might yeah. play a lot this game coming up. He, he might. I think I counted at least six different linebacker formations, right? Because when they were in base, okay, Jannard Avery was the strong side linebacker. Eric Wilson, and then um, T.J. Edwards. But then later in the game, they put Patrick Johnson in there in base instead yeah, of um, – that. So that's a second one. And then the third one was then when they took out Eric Wilson and put in Sean Bradley. So they had three different bases, and then they had a couple of different nickels, right? They would have Eric Wilson and Alex Singleton. They would have Eric Wilson and T.J. Edwards. And there was uh, an Eric Wilson and Patrick Johnson nickel, I believe, as well. So they had they had just situations and different formations for that. And sometimes they worked, sometimes they didn't. But it's interesting how they had the optionality there. It was really cool. And we'll get to the DB to finish the show off because, man, they did some cool stuff. But I, I just – it's interesting. that we There's so much happened that we had not heard about. And we, it was kind of cool to, to hear that they were doing this stuff. Mm-hmm. And I, I just, you know, I came up with this line that this staff, based on the people I spoke with, has the ability to morph into something like by series. It's kind of what you were talking about. They were making these small lineup changes, very subtle, but it it's really now. I have no idea it was because it was week one. Because remember, uh, they didn't tackle on, they didn't tackle on training camp at all. They didn't take anyone to the ground unless it was a mistake. They did what's called thud. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of stars didn't play very much in the, in the preseason. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's why they felt they had to, to, to change, you know, to rotate and stuff. It was just really interesting. What never saw the stuff with the previous staff. Just, 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 this is all new. And it's funny on the fanatic, uh, this early this week, it was it, on uh, all three shows, the morning, midday, and, and uh, with Miss Nelly, all these calls came in. Really, they were like, quote, really good to see this, really good to see that, because they just, this previous staff wasn't doing it. Right, right. I want to, I would like to, f- follow up for the next pod on Jannard Avery, how they use him and how he played. I think some people got okay. the misconception that he, he was like getting out of his gap too often, but the way I watched it, and again, this is just me, my eyes, I'll, I'll run this past some people. Like, for example, there was a one play where he was um, kind of shooting through the gap uh, as, as, a, as the, on the ball, Sam, and he slipped. All right. I think oh, the point okay. of him just shooting right immediately in my belief was because they, they were the Falcons were in a run formation was to redirect the run a certain way. If he's already there, then the running back sees him coming in. The running back's got to go to either cut or go in a different different lane ordinarily because he's there. He's kind of someone who redirects the run. But because he fell, it just left the the lane wide open. So the running back just ran right past him and and got I think it was Davis and got like eleven or twelve yards. And people were like, "Oh, this guy is doesn't know what he's doing out there." No, I mean he fell. But um, they do sometimes they use them as a gap shooter and sometimes as an edge setter. Hmm. So that, that's really probably new for him because he's mostly been 
a pass rusher yep. here with the Eagles, and I'm sure the Browns felt in the three four like in the same way, kind of a an edge rushing threat, a movable edge rusher. Right. So what we heard about um, Avery in their OTAs is like he clearly was going to be the number one Sam. Mm -hmm. He whatever they asked him to do, he did it. But he's a smaller guy, six foot even. Good. Long, he has long arm for guys. You know, he's kind of built low to the ground. But it's interesting. You know, uh, we. Because remember, we were trying to figure out like how much is the Sam line linebacker going to play in this in this for this team? And he played thirty one percent of the snaps. So, right. Okay, we'll see. We because this team seemed they morphed into so many different things on defense during the game, you know, by by quarter, by series, whatever. We just don't know what they're going to do game to game. I, I don't think they're going to play man. Uh, that, that's the only thing I think we could safely say is they're not going to play a lot of man. This is going to be his own team because that's Gannon's background. Mm -hmm. But other than that. Um, are they going to be mostly cover four team? No, they did. Well, they might later, but they played everything in this game. It's just really fascinating, the, their approach. And by the way, it worked. Woo. Right. It worked. I can see them playing some two-man, which is sort of zone up top, right? Because you have both safeties deep in a zone, and then everybody underneath is playing man. So it really yep. still – you're in man, but man. you're kind of guarding against trying to get beat up top. So right. I'm sure that there will be some of those looks. So They did too. The they, they did. Yeah, they, they well, did I know they – I know they played cover two. I know they played some cover two, but that's a little different, right. obviously. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is that they they did so much stuff in this game, and we'll get the DBs in a sec. Mm -hmm. It was just we didn't have any frame of reference because in preseason they weren't doing any of this stuff because that was on purpose. And in training camp, you know, I would start see stuff I'd ask about, hey, is this you know sound right? And then you get some stuff that uh, was similar, and then you'd say, well, they're also doing this, but – yeah, they're doing this, and then they do something different, but yet some of the same, but something different. I'm like, wow, okay, maybe the staff is, who knows what they might do next week. It's fascinating. Very much so. Um, yeah, I mean, for a, a spot on the team, Adam, that would always be the weakness that you'd always worry about for the last three or four years now, you know, going into every game. God, you just hope nobody gets beat deep. You hope that everybody stays healthy. You hope that there's no really bad matchup, either at the safety level or the corner level. You know, when we talked about Calvin Ridley and Kyle Pitts, uh, couldn't have asked for for a better effort from that secondary. And I agree. I think the coaching and the asking of them mm. to only do specific jobs was probably a really big part of that. F really good job. Um, Simon football, they played whatever their the responsibilities within the zone. They, they carried it out. It just was great. Uh, Zacchaeus, the kid, Olamide Zacchaeus, who was the shot play guy, he didn't do anything. Right. They shut down Russell Gage completely. It just didn't have a target. How about that? It's unbelievable. I, I just th – th this this game, I, there was no way I could pick a blowout. I might pick them to win 20. The Eagles won 24 to, 20, 24 to 20. Right. But what I couldn't account for is that th their, their, their ability to play within their zones so well and to play with such discipline because if you just matched up talent to talent, the Falcons should have had more success. But I didn't account for Simon football, the way they're coached, just because you don't have any frame of reference. They've never played a regular season game together. So it's just um, – this, this is a zone defense, and these guys are being coached well. It's uh, really fascinating. And, they, they, again, they didn't play one – they didn't play one particular zone. They, they switched it up all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try to find out how much uh, cover two, four, and six, and you know, three that they played. If anyone, if anyone we talked to could get it right. percentage-wise. Uh, but look, I'm just curious. You know, I'd like to keep track of this because I don't know if, if – see, because Gannon coached under Zimmer and Eberflus. I'm ver I'm, and, and I know with Minnesota, they play more more man than the Indy. I do wonder later on, will, will Gannon play some man? I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll find out. Here's where I think the – I meant to say this before, where I where we question Arthur Smith, Smith a little bit, and I think the game really turned, right? I mean, the, the Eagles score a touchdown on their first possession. It's 7-3. And the Falcons do a really good job. They're again, they're running the ball well. They're taking advantage of some of the personnel groupings that the Eagles have that just weren't doing a good job against the run, whether it was gap integrity or just not good enough. And they get all the way down to the four yard line, and then it's first to go at the four, and then Ridgeway. Amazingly, I've never seen. I don't think I've ever seen a game with three defensive holdings, two by one guy in my life before. But ridiculous. That's where we are. So then it becomes first and goal at the two, and. Two tw twice, Matt Ryan is call, uh, they call a um, passes. I, I was shocked by that, and they were both go incomplete. So good job by the Eagles defense. But why in the world 
are you calling pass? I mean, you were gashing them. You got the ball to two yards. Yeah, but I, I don't agree, though. I, I, I think you, you look at the personnel. Now, if you want to say, why didn't they mix it up, that's fine. But I, I, I would – it's all philosophy. You, you, you don't have to run every play. You don't have to pass every play. But I would have rather them mix it up or, or try to isolate – so what I would have liked to have seen, and this is a, I'd have to find out, because I thought for sure they would get Ridley on a route and he'd win. He didn't win though, based on uh, remember they played a three man line on one of those. They they just they backed off. They dropped eight, and Ryan's looking around. He didn't know where the hell to go with a football. He almost threw a pick by pick six. Mm -hmm. uh, that was great defense. But I hear you. I, I would like to see though. I would have liked to have seen them throw it. Um, on that series you were talking about early I mean, on in it, and, but first and goal at the two. I, I hear you if it's first and play goal at action, five, two, six, guy, seven. But the two that feels a little bit too much. Pete Carroll, Russell Wilson in the Super Bowl to me, especially when you <laughs> you just ran the ball down their throat. Like, like make sure. them make the Eagles prove that they can stop that. So then they settle for the field goal instead, right? Seven and six. Then the Eagles have to punt. Atlanta gets the ball back again, and so so now I have to wonder this. Is it the Eagles straighten things out, or is it the one, two, three, four penalties that Atlanta commits on the next oh, drive? Oh, the picks. That they missed it. They, they got caught for the picks. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they completely get behind the sticks. I'm, I mean, what, what are you going to do on that? I mean, I don't know. It was, it was very odd to me. I mean, they get two penalties back to back that um, that put them way behind the sticks, and, and they have to pass. So I'm not. I'm not sure. Look, I th the Eagles obviously did better, but I think the Falcons. Help the Falcons stop the run by just running them by you know putting themselves behind the sticks all the time. Yeah, uh, I just I I just thought that in, in putting the penalties aside, I thought Arthur Smith called a very conservative game. Uh, Sirianni was super aggressive the first half. The pass run, the heavy heavy pass. It, it some of those seven of those seven run. Well, I, I'd have to see how many runs he had in the first half, but right. I do know this the. They were between 66 and 70% run. Uh, excuse me, pass in the first half the Eagles were. Mm -hmm. they, were they came out smoking with, with – and I, I do wonder, analytically, because right. we, we have not got a straight answer on this, how much of influence does the front office or Jeffrey Lurie, because, you know, we, everyone's outlined it. You know, anyone who covers the Eagles has written about this. Jeffrey's insistence. You know, the, 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 athletic, articles, the athletic article was so mm -hmm. good, outlining Jeffrey's wanting to um, – them coming out throwing – so I do wonder, is this just a one-game aberration? Or are they going to be more – fit? you know, not 50. No one's 50-50 in the first half. But is it going to be 60-40 next game? Don't know. We'll see. We shall see. All right, that's going to do it for this episode of Inside the Birds, the leading podcast in Eagles Intel. Big thanks to our producer, Hunter Brody. Check him out on YouTube. His channel is called Sports Talk with Broads. His Twitter account, at Broads81. And his website, his new website, is Broads Media. Dot com check all that out and of course we thank you for flying with us inside the bird